Dr. Schelderijk, we're here in your home in North London. Thank you very much for giving us your time. And we're here to talk to you about thoughts and consciousness. Mainstream scientists usually hold the view that our thinking only takes place inside our brains and it lim is limited to our brains. Things like telepathy shouldn't really exist. What do you think um, indicates that thoughts actually go beyond our brains? Well, the standard materialist view, the dominant dogma at the moment, is that mental activity is brain activity. It's all in the head. But the evidence suggests that our minds reach out much further than our heads through attention and intention. Um, one line of evidence is that when we look at people, we can sometimes affect them. People can turn round uh, if we're staring at them. Um, they seem to detect our attention. Um, the vast majority of people have had this experience. They've felt when they're being looked at and they've made other people turn around by looking at them. That's the effect of attention. The effect of intention uh, is also detectable by people from far away. If we think about somebody, we want to call them on the telephone uh, and then we call them. Quite often, uh, people feel our intention before we make the call. They start thinking about us, and when we make the call, they say, that's funny, I was just thinking about you. Now, I've done a lot of experiments that show the sense of being stared at is real. The telephone telepathy is not just a coincidence, it's not just random chance, it's a real phenomenon. Um, and these phenomena, which are extremely common, almost everyone's experienced them, um, show that our minds are in fact extended beyond our brains. Can you tell us about some of the most important experiments you've done and what you, the results you've got? In research on telephone telepathy, what we do is experiments in which the subject has um, a number of callers, minimum number is two. We've mainly done these experiments with four callers. They choose four people that they know well. Um, usually friends or family members, uh, they sit being filmed in a room with a landline telephone with no caller ID display. We pick one of the four callers at random and ask them to call the subject. The phone rings. They know it's one of these four people, uh, but they have to guess who it is before they pick it up. Um, so they may say, I think it's Timothy. They pick it up, say, hello, Timothy. They're right or they're wrong. By chance, they'd be right about one time in four, 25% of the time. In fact, in hundreds of these trials, the score rate is about 45%. It's a very significant effect. Um, some people are better at this than others, um, but uh, even when we have mass experiments with mass participation, including people who aren't very good at it, we're getting very significantly above chance scores. And you've widened this and included things like emails and text messages in your experiments. The, the same phenomenon happens with uh, emails, with text messages, and with messages sent on the internet. Um, with text messages, we've done experiments where uh, people have to guess who's just sent them a text message. And again, the results come out above the chance level. With emails, we've done the same experiment. You have four people who could send you an email. Um, at a particular time, uh, they, one of these four people, randomly chosen, sends you an email, and you have to guess who's, send, who's writing you an email at that time. And you send an email with your guess on it, and we know that you've made the guess before you've received the email, because everything is timed precisely on computers. Um, so um, people can also guess who's sending them emails or who's sending them text messages above chances. The same phenomenon really as telephone telepathy. You pick up somebody's intention to get in touch with you. And it's not just people, there's also animals because you've done a lot of work with animals as well. These abilities, the sense of being stared at and telepathy, which show the minds extended beyond the brain, aren't confined to people. Um, they apply to animals as well. Many animals can tell when they're being watched. Uh, we've interviewed hunters and wildlife photographers who watch wild animals from a distance when the, the people are hidden. The animals can't see them, they can't smell them. Uh, and yet the animals seem to sense their presence. This is a common observation among hunters and wildlife photographers. 
I think in nature this would play a very useful role uh, in predator-prey relationships. A prey animal that could tell when a predator was watching it would have a better chance of escaping than one that couldn't tell. Um, and in relation to telepathy, animals also seem to be able to pick up intentions. I've done a lot of experiments with uh, domestic animals like dogs and cats. Um, one of the commonest phenomena there is dogs that know when their owners are coming home. The dog goes and waits by a door or a window uh, when a person's on the way home. Um, sometimes 10 minutes, 15 minutes before they come home when they're still several kilometers away. We've shown that this is not explainable in terms of sounds or smells or routine. Um, it seems to be telepathic. The animal is picking up the person's intention to come home. The same happens with cats and with parrots and with horses and with several other species. So assuming that our thoughts are not just brain waves within our brains, what do you think is the nature of thoughts then? What's the, the essence of them? Well, I think our mental activity is mainly directed towards possible actions. Our conscious thoughts are mostly about what we can do or what we could do and choosing between possible actions. And most of our activity depends on intentions. We're doing things for a reason. If we're hungry, we look for food. If we want to go to the lavatory, we look for a lavatory. Um, you know, it, if you're um, a young man and you, you, you might look for girls. Uh, you know, the, there are, we usually have motives for what we do. People do jobs because they want to get paid and, and so on. So, uh, and animals too, when they look for mates, they look for food, they try to escape from danger. Most of our activity has purposes, intentions. And these intentions reach out beyond our minds to connect us with the environment. If an animal is a hungry predator is looking for a prey animal, it's searching the environment. When it sees one, its attention is fixed upon it. And uh, so these are not exactly conscious thoughts in words. Animals are not thinking in German or in English. Um, they're uh, thinking more in images and with desires and emotions and intentions. And of course, a lot of our own thinking uh, can take place without words. Um, if you hear a frightening sound, you react to it, or if you see a threatening sight, you try and escape for it, uh, from it. You don't necessarily spend a whole time, a lot of time working it out in words. You just run away or uh, do some, uh, have a defensive reaction. Um, so it would be wrong to think that all thoughts or intentions are to do with words. They're mainly to do with possible actions, and those actions connect our minds with the environment through perception, through looking at things or through hearing things, uh, and through our intentions. If you're a hunter and you're going out to hunt for something, you have an intention to find a prey animal, and that prey animal may pick up your intention and uh, be more uh, cautious, or it might escape because of its pick picking up your intention. So our thoughts, our intentions uh, are not really confined to our brains. Now, the, the question of an internal dialogue, it may be that when we have internal dialogues, we're just thinking to ourselves with, with words. It may be that that's located mainly in or around the head. Um, but as soon as we're directed towards the environment, to the external world or to other people, our thoughts or intentions reach out into the world and can have effects at a distance. And have you observed any principles by which thoughts work? Um, does, for instance, distance make a difference? Or the emotions we attach to our thoughts? Well, our thoughts and intentions and desires and needs are all related to emotions of one kind or another. You know, hunger, fear, uh, self-preservation, sexual desire, and so forth. We have motives for what we do, emotions. Um, and these emotions can have an effect at a distance. If I want to telephone somebody in Australia and I start thinking about them, they can pick up my intention. So when I ring them, they may say, I was just thinking about you. We've actually done telephone telepathy experiments between Britain and Australia, mm -hmm. and we've shown that they work just as well over 
thousands of kilometers as they do over a few kilometers. Um, in fact, in our experiments with people in Australia, we used subjects who were young Australians living in London, and the, their people in Australia that they were ringing or who were ringing them were people like their mothers, girlfriends, and so on. People in England were new acquaintances. They actually did better with the people in Australia than with the people in England because they were closer to them emotionally. What matters is emotional closeness, not physical distance. And what do you think is the basis for this? I know you speak of morphic fields and resonance. Does this provide any explanation for these phenomena? The two conventional theories of the mind are the materialist theory that it's all inside the brain. Brain activity is mental activity. Uh, the dualist theory, which has been around for hundreds of years, uh, says the mind and the brain are totally different things. The mind is completely non-physical, immaterial, and not in space and time at all. What I'm putting forward is a theory that's between those two. I'm saying that the mind is in the brain, but it extends beyond it through fields. And we're used to the idea of fields being in and beyond material objects. The magnetic field of a magnet is in the magnet and extends beyond it. The gravitational field of the Earth is in the Earth and extends far beyond it. The field of a mobile phone, a handy, is in the phone and extends beyond it. And I think the fields of our minds are inside our brains and inside our bodies and extend beyond them. So it's, it's not all inside the brain. And these fields connect us to the objects of our attention or intention and they stretch out far beyond the brain. But they're still, of course, related to the brain because otherwise they wouldn't be able to influence our actions, uh, which has to happen through the brain. Assuming that our thoughts are not just limited to our brains and our own bodies, what do you think are the implications for our lives and for our worldview? If our minds are extended beyond our brains and interconnect us with the world around us and with each other, It means that we're much more interconnected than we usually assume. The materialist theory, still the dominant orthodoxy, says that the mind is inside the brain. That means each of us is isolated from each other in the privacy of our skulls. Uh, it means we're much more private, but we're much more isolated. Now, this view of our thoughts and intentions interconnecting us with the world around us, with animals, with other people, Uh, means that we're much more interconnected. In a sense, we're less private because our thoughts and intentions can affect other people. Their thoughts and intentions can affect us. Um, but I think that's the way things are. We're social animals and we've evolved to live in groups with other people. And no social animals can survive unless they're interconnected with other members of their group. Um, We see this in every social animal, ants, bees, wasps, uh, termites, in flocks of birds, in schools of fish, in packs of wolves. Uh, all social animals have coordination with other members of the group. And I think that telepathy is a normal means of communication among uh, social animals between members of groups. So that's one implication. We're much more interconnected than we might otherwise be. Another implication is that um, our brains are not doing everything they usually assume to do. Um, I think brains are grossly overrated uh, at present because people assume the brain is doing everything. I think the brain is more like a receiver, mm -hmm. uh, more like a TV receiver than like a video recorder. It's not storing everything and doing everything. It's open to transmissions that come from outside and it's sending out transmissions to Uh, the, the world around it. Um, so it's working in a completely different way. So I think this would lead to a very different understanding of ourselves and, our, and, our, and of our minds. It also would suggest that these so-called paranormal phenomena, like telepathy, are not paranormal at all. They're perfectly normal. They're part of our animal nature. Animals have them too. They've evolved because they're useful. Um, and they're there because we're social animals like other social animals. So does it matter what we think and, and how we think? Yes, I mean, if our thoughts are simply private uh, things inside our heads, 
it doesn't much matter what you think, it only matters what you say or what you do. But if your thoughts and attitudes and intentions and hopes and fears and loves and hates can have influences beyond your brain, just by thinking about them or having those feelings, it means we are more responsible for what we think. Mm -hmm. It's not just what we say and do, but what we think that matters. Uh, and of course, most religious traditions have recognized this for a long time. It's our thoughts as well as our actions that are important, uh, whereas from the materialist point of view, it's only the actions. You've written in book, The Science Delusion. Can you tell us a little bit about the content? Yes. Well, The Science Delusion is about the science delusion itself, which is the belief that science already understands the nature of reality and principle, leaving only the details to be filled in. That's a belief of many people in the modern world, and I think it's a, a terrible delusion. I think science understands very little about the nature of reality. It certainly understands something, and our modern technology is a proof that it's very powerful. Um, television, computers, mobile phones, and so forth. They're all proofs, uh, and, and many of the triumphs of modern medicine, that our scientific understanding is helpful and important. But um, the idea that we understand almost everything is, I think, completely illusory. The thing we understand least are our own minds and our own consciousness. And what I show in The Science Delusion is that present-day science is based on a belief system, the materialist belief system, um, which has ten basic dogmas, uh, assumptions, which are simply taken for granted. In the book, I turn each of these dogmas into a question and examine it scientifically to see whether this question, uh, whether this dogma is in fact supported by science, reason, and evidence. And in all ten cases, it turns out that they're rather unscientific assumptions. Um, I want science to be more scientific, not less, but being more scientific means taking a scientific look at the assumptions or dogmas of science, not taking them for granted. For example, the dogmas include uh, nature is mechanical or machine-like. In other words, it's more like a machine than an organism. I think it's actually more like an organism than a machine. Um, matter is unconscious. That's another dogma. So that becomes the question, is matter unconscious? And it opens up the question of some kind of mental activity in many kinds of material organization, not just in brains. Um, there's the dogma, the laws of nature are fixed, it becomes the question, are the laws of nature fixed? Nature has no purposes, it becomes the question, is nature purposeless? And so on. So in this book, I question the dogmas of science, and I show that science would be better off, more scientific, uh, more exciting, and much more fun if we let go of this belief system that's dominated it for more than a century. I was fascinated to read how this materialistic view dominates almost every field of society. And particularly for me as a doctor, um, I often find that medicine is, is very much dominated by the materialistic view of the world. This materialistic framework of thought dominates everything in the modern world. It dominates the educational system, government, business, the civil service, the professions, and, uh, of course, medicine. Uh, they're all based on, on this view of the world. And most people don't question it because they say, well, it must be right because it's so successful. Modern medicine in many ways is very successful. Keyhole surgery, antibiotics. There are many obvious triumphs of modern medicine. Um, and so people don't question it for that reason, I think. Um, but when you do question it, you see that we could have a much better kind of science uh, and a much better kind of medicine that's more integrative and more inclusive. It doesn't mean we lose the advantages of modern medicine or modern science. They'll still be there. But we can have a much more expanded view of things. And my own belief is that um, if we have a more integrated medical system that takes into account what are now called complementary and alternative therapies, as well as much more preventive medicine, we could have a much cheaper medical system. And of course, everywhere in the world, that's very necessary because it's becoming impossibly expensive. So I think that the change in medicine will be driven by economics as much as by anything. Um, but um, 
I think there are very good intellectual and scientific reasons for thinking we need to expand the kind of medicine we have instead of keeping it within narrow materialist limits. One of the things you mentioned is the placebo effect, which is quite astonishing if you think about it. Well, I think the placebo effect is very clear evidence that the power of the mind is very important in healing, in cures. Um, for a long time, conventional doctors treated the placebo effect as a nuisance. It got in the way of clinical trials. It was just a kind of nuisance you had to take into account. Uh, but I think the attitudes towards it are shifting. We now realize that the placebo effect is a very important part of the healing process uh, in conventional medicine as well as unconventional medicine. Doctors used to say, you know, we have real medicine with real medicines, uh, whereas alternative and complementary practitioners, uh, uh, they're quacks. And if they get people better, that's just because of the placebo effect. Um, but uh, we now know that the placebo effect is going on everywhere all the time. It's a major problem in drug trials because many modern drugs like Prozac, in fact, aren't much better than placebos. In fact, it's, it is no better than a placebo if you take all the trials into account. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we need to, to take into account people's beliefs, attitudes and social support networks because there's now a lot of evidence that people's cure, uh, getting better from diseases depends not just on medicines but on their belief, on their attitude, on their spiritual practices uh, on their social networks, and even on factors like whether they keep a dog or cat. People with dogs or cats get better from uh, heart attacks uh, more effectively and quicker than people without dogs and cats. Um, there's been many studies that show so many other factors at work. It's not just a disease, a pill that's a magic bullet and the cure of the disease. There's so many other factors, which I'm sure every doctor knows, but the medical education tends to minimize these and put the maximum emphasis on chemistry and physics, drugs and surgery. What are you working at at the moment and what are the kind of questions you're trying to solve? Oh, well, I'm continuing with my research on telephone telepathy um, and I'm working on the development of apps which will enable some of these um, tests for psychic abilities like telepathy to be carried out on mobile phones and uh, just as part of ordinary life using modern technologies. And I feel that by uh, making these things much more widely accessible, uh, millions of people could potentially participate in this research and also learn something about their own abilities. Uh, I think that's probably a better way to go than um, just doing it through schools and textbooks and so on. If it happens in the real world through apps and modern technologies, this will be uh, help to shift people's awareness of the nature of the mind and the power of the mind. I'm also continuing my research on the extended mind and um, I'm preparing a new edition of my book, The Sense of Being Stared At. That's in German, that one's called Der Sieb der Sinn des Menschen. Mm -hmm. um, and so that will come out in a new edition, a new expanded and updated edition. Um, and I continue my research on morphic resonance, the, um, the memory in nature. Um, we now have some very exciting new experiments on morphic resonance going on in laboratories here in England. Um, and uh, I'm very hopeful that um, these fields of science will open up as the taboos that keep the materialist position in its completely dominant position, as those taboos weaken, all sorts of new scientific possibilities become uh, open to us. And that's really what I'm engaged in, mm -hmm. as well as in discussions with um, funding agencies, uh, including private funding agencies, to see how innovative science can be supported financially. Um, at the moment, it doesn't get much support. Uh, but that could change, and I myself think that the field of scientific research could become much more exciting in the next 10 years or so as new possibilities open up. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for this very interesting interview.